Chapter 31, A Rare Symbol Found Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore Lips brushed against cheeks, against lips, against neck, gently and carefully, not a word was spoken as the growling and the purring noises rose. Veins throbbed as breaths were stolen and given back. Glenn reached his arms across Laffet and pulled her up against him. Shivers ran through their nerves and made them both tremble. Glenn woke up the next morning and was enjoying the afterglow of the makeout with Laffet. It was as fabulous as the time he was accepted as a potential sorcerer back in Bysir City. It was so wondrous that he doubted it was real, until something moved beside his pillow. Laugh it. It was laugh it on my bed, Glenn almost cried out. The next moment, all the pleasant feelings rushed back to Glenn. He then slung his hand over the arm of laugh it, who was lying with her bare back facing him, and stopped at her bosom. He touched and stroked her lightly so as to not wake her up. Ah, Laffet murmured something in a low voice as if the whisper came from her throat. She then turned her face to Glenn and stared at him affectionately with her pair of startling eyes, which were glowing under her slender eyebrows. Glenn gulped on seeing that tender love. At the same time, he was tortured by the fact that now he had to take care of someone while he could barely do that for himself. Laffet seemed like a liability to him, an albatross around his neck. How could I possibly survive in this cruel world with an extra burden on me? Glenn rebuked himself in his heart. But I just followed my instinct. One can't blame his instinct, I guess, Glenn consoled. Laffet put her hands around Glenn and dictated, My dear, from now on, you belong to me, and to me, alone. But there is a long road ahead of us. I mean, we are only students. We have to be sorcerers to keep our love going. Laffet's plump breasts nearly pressed Glenn out of breath. And I need you to pass the sorcery test and come back to me, safe and sound. Laffet had rattled out everything Glenn wanted to say. Maybe that's it. We will keep loving each other, and I will look after her. Glenn came to terms with this fact. Laffet pecked Glenn in his forehead and left. I wish Oldham could have had a chance to see this. Glenn had accepted Laffet as the love of his life as he watched her walked out of his sight. Glenn then went to his experiment table. There has been no progress in the study of life code, since no better microscope was available to Glenn yet. So, he had been working on the element matrix lately. Despite the fact that he had cured and repermuted the matrix and thus had his mental strength lifted accordingly there was much more that could be tapped from it the ones that hadn't been found out besides the 26 existent symbols and signs. But to dip further, a living person would be needed as experiment material. But the experiments on living people would come at dear costs. He, she would be wanted by all sorcery schools on the sorcerer continent, and there would be dedicated hunters to track them down and get them, just as had happened to the two sorcerers who had tested potions on Sam and sorcerers who went bad would tag the black sorcerers, a stain that would never be erased. Sorcerers would neither kill nor run tests on humans. That was the bottom line. But there was an alternative to testing humans, to buy a human-like slave from the foreign land. And Glenn could get one from some sorcerers if he paid heavily. Human-like slaves from the foreign land were practically not humans. They just had similar level of intelligence as humans, that was all. That meant that they were not protected by sorcerers. Glenn had been reaching out to get a foreign land slave but did not get anywhere. But there was something extremely valuable that Glenn thought might make up for it a little bit. It was a length of a twig from a tree, which was said to have been stricken by a thunder. That was the reason that a store on the trading market at the Black Tower could sell a blackened seemingly worthless twig. It contained some raw force from the thunder when elements collided mutually. That store owner was selling it as a material for alchemy. Soon, Glenn found that the twig was not helping for making a magical tool after heaps of failed experiments. Instead, he found out something else about the twig. 
In the process of the chemical experiments with the twig, Glenn discovered that the twig had a highly condensed and stable power in it, and once, a symbol appeared at one end of it. It was a complex pattern and could barely be discerned. Glenn exclaimed at this observation. The symbol contained high energy and shared similar shapes with the 26 symbols and signs. He concluded that it must be a rare element, which had been transferred from the thunder and was conserved in the twig. Sorcerers desired rare elements dearly. But it was extremely hard to find one, not to mention the pain and difficulty one had to go through to add it to his, her element matrix. But the power it generated, as a result, was stunning. Sorcerer Deal had been assigned the mission of recruiting Kyrie and Bayona, largely because of his strong power resulting from the fact that he had succeeded carving a newly discovered rare element into his element matrix. He had the school's trust because of, essentially, a rare element. That was why Nilmar, a level 2 sorcerer, had to arrange Sam to use the pre-concocted powder to call up the Harado Leviathan to consume Dior's strength before he showed up on the ship to battle him. And it was said that a rare symbol could not be simply recorded in a sorcery book, it had to be carried on to another one by separating a part of the host's soul. Chapter 32 Right before the first year's sorcery test. Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore. All the first year pupils, novices and students alike of the Black Isota School of Sorcerers had gathered at the large square where they had assembled three years ago, when they were admitted to the school. The only difference was that there were far less pupils this time. Many of them must have been murdered accidentally. At the time, a sorcerer was motivating the crowd of students in excitement. Today, you are going to take the first year's sorcery test, and there are a total of 1,577 pupils from the Black Isota, along with all the other first years from the schools in Section 12 of the Holy Tower. The maps being handed out to you will guide you. Your goal for the test is to spend a month of time on an enclosed land in the Bramble Forest and come out of it alive then you will be considered to have passed. A month. Is it that easy? What has changed? The test was said to be a terror. Pupils on the square buzzed. On the rightmost of the throng, Glenn, Laffitt, Chris, Nina, Robinson and a girl named Robin, who was in a relationship with Robinson, were standing close to each other. Robinson was the first to express his confusion. It said that we are the best ones in commanding sorceries and the biggest in number among many batches of pupils coming to the Isota school in recent decades. For these reasons, a rumor has been circulating that the school has decided to ratchet up the test's difficulty. Then I'd wonder why only come out of the enclosed place would make us pass. Maybe the place is inhabited by monsters that only real sorcerers could take down. Robin pouted. Stop that. There is no way it's going to be like that. Robinson cut in. I doubt it, too. If that was the case, I bet no more than one-tenth of us would be able to get out of that place, and even those three, Glenn pointed to Kyrie, Bayona, and Sam. Even those three may fail. Chris calmed the rest of the group, don't fuss. Just wait for the map, and things will clear out. On accepting the map from the map handler's hand, Glenn noticed a chain-shaped drawing inked in the top right of the map. Then the chain got off the map and onto Glenn's forehead before being carved into it. And the chain retained its former shape. Glenn frowned, but he was not in the mood of lingering on it as all the other pupils with the map in hand were clamoring. He stared into the map, too. The testing ground was a 300 square kilometers area marked off in the Bramble Forest. It was forbidden to breach the frontier, or they would be warned by sorcerers who would be guarding them. Attached on the map was a booklet explaining the details of the contest. According to its rules, there would be mirror, where the sealing sorcery was applied, deliveries on three specific days during their 30-day stay. The first delivery of mirrors was on the first day of the survival match and a total of 100 mirrors would be planted in different places within the area. 
Within a mirror was buried one student-level magical tool. The second batch consisted of ten magical tools that were a lot more powerful than the previous arrival and would be set on the tenth day. The last one would arrive on the twentieth day. Only one mirror arrived that day and the bonus were medicines and sorcery notes that were thought to be able to spike up the receiver's mental strength. Besides the clarification on the mirrors, a few words were written on the attachment, for every contestant who is killed, the chain mark on his, her forehead would then be transferred to the killers. For every additional chain one gets, 500 magical stones, an amount that would certainly sweep the contestants off their feet, would be conferred to him, her as a reward. Glenn had thought that pupils in the Black Isotta were not supposed to kill each other, but it seemed that people had to kill to live now. If the pupils were in luck, they might find a place to hide until a month later, but everybody was aware that go to the hiding, or relying solely on luck, was not an optimal option. They needed to be in extensive search of the mirrors and to power themselves up to be a hunter, rather than becoming a prey. Glenn had an enhanced level of mental strength now and was armed with loads of magical tools, which put him in a good position to be in the match. And nobody except for the few pupils with innate talent such as Kyrie and Bayona had a chance to beat him. Consuming magical stones for the purpose of elevating my power was wisdom, I believe. Glenn recalled the huge amount of stones he had earned and had used in exchange for a variety of tools, including his mask and symbolic insects, among other treasures. But it would be a mistake to underestimate any enemy, in particular, the second batch of mirror supply on the tenth day might pose a real threat. We are being cornered. There is no way out, Robinson cried out after reviewing the map and the attached booklet. His cry was met with a grim laugh. Chris then spoke. This is the time when we can have a real fight, like we did back on the ship. What is the point of working so hard at sorceries in the past three years if we are not going to fight? Unlike before, when we were weak setting foot here and when Laffit was protecting us from. As Chris was referencing Laffit, the rest of the group's attention was focused on her. She was wearing leggings, with the medial part of them cut away and showing her snow-white thigh. She moved her head away from the map and looked at Chris, I was doing my part. Now we work together to get us through this trial of fate. These words were uttered in a tone that could not be challenged. And I'd say we will be sent to the forest randomly. Nina, Robinson and Laffit stopped as she was listing the ones who should be looked after by the other team members. She then turned to Glenn. Nina, Robinson and Glenn. You three might not be that strong enough to jostle for the mirrors on the first day since it would be quite competitive. So protect yourselves. And the rest of us will try our best to knock down some mirrors to get the upper hand. After that, all members meet it here. Laugh it pinpointed a place on the map. Laugh it, you don't have to. I can take care of myself. I've got. Don't. Laffit said softly, still regarding him as the one who knew nothing at all beyond that olfactory mapping or something. She held back her desire to say things like for the sake of you and instead she said, the twelve superiors of the Death Sail League and Sam are having a brief meeting. I will be back in a minute. Before Glenn said anything, Laffit held her arms around his waist and kissed him fervently. People surrounding them looked with their eyes dilated and mouth widely opened. Laffit handed Glenn a ring as she asked him to take care and left. The ring was a magical tool of hers, the one that she used to produce the vine. It was called the Heart of Vine. Glenn put it on, and it matched the gold ring on his other ear. Glenn sighed. In Laffit's heart, he had always been the one that required constant care and protection but being cared for really made him feel wonderful. Half an hour glass of time later, contestants began to be led by over ten sorcerers onto a huge scale. Each of them stood on one side of the scale and the other end was loaded with many magical stones. As the magical stones decayed into grey stones, the pupils' figure obscured and then disappeared. Chapter 33 Glenn Killed 2 
Translator, John underscore Kui Editor, Zane underscore. With the consumption of some magical stones, Glenn was squeezed as thin as lasagna on the scale before he disappeared. Ah! Glenn had passed through time and space to arrive at the Bramble Forest, the designated place of killing. Glenn almost vomited after the displacement. He had not dabbled with hematology sorcery, which could provide greater endurance and make one less prone to gross things. Glenn was not a moron to let his guard down even though he was caught by dizziness. He observed that two students were confronting each other about ten meters away. Glenn could discern that neither of them belonged to his school based on the marks on their foreheads. Actually, one of them was from the Ivory Castle School of Sorcerers, and the other came from the Compass School. Glenn had overheard their hostile conversation before his existence was detected by them. They are not my school fellas and even if they are, that are still my enemies. Things may be slightly different for members from the Death Sail League, Glenn said to himself and stealthily regarded the two students before him as irreconcilable adversaries. Glenn was wearing his ashen mask and that hindered them from recognizing the mark on Glenn's forehead. Thus, they had no idea if Glenn was one of their own guys. Then again, proximity of relationships didn't waver a person from being an enemy. The simple truth applied for Glenn and them, too. Catching that Glenn was breathing heavily and was at the verge of sickening, they transferred their ire on Glenn simultaneously, as if there was an agreement in effect, binding them to do so. The two students took the first strikes. With a mutter of spells, a short yet pointed knife approached towards Glenn and in a split of second, an icicle hurtled behind the knife, as if the former was chasing the latter. Glenn was still trying to recover from his sickness and was sort of reeling when he was suddenly faced with the brutal and violent attacks. Since running or dodging were not an option, he produced the defense shield by virtue of his ashen mask. As you might recall, the mask offered extraordinary defensive power by creating a shield to assist in countering an attack, and offenses below 20 points would simply be bounced off. Clank, clank. The knife hit the shield and bounced off to a stone on the ground, followed by a shower of broken pieces of the icicle. Less than 20 points power of attack. That is weak. Glenn thought to himself. He was aware of their powerlessness since their weapons were both destroyed by his shield. It was commonplace for students to not be able to produce over 20 points power of offense because most of them only had a mental strength limited within 10 to 17 degrees, with only a three-year meditation to stimulate the strength up. The number of those whose mental strength had reached 24 degrees or more, like Glenn himself, could be counted on one's fingers. The two students gaped anxiously at Glenn as if he was a wild animal who was ready to get them. And they wondered what power was hiding beneath that mask. One of them came to himself apparently more quickly than the other and ran away immediately by reaching a much greater pace with the help of an acceleration sorcery. This condemned the other student to be a much easier prey to Glenn. And Glenn would not let go of an easy prey. Glenn produced a firebird, which flew at the student in an agile manner. The student caught on fire and burned wildly as he screamed miserably. As was illustrated by sorcerer Elaine on the basics of sorceries, the firebird was a fancier form of attack with much higher degrees of energy, it could be as high as 70 points. As a result, the poor student was burnt out in a few minutes. Thanks to the killing, the mark on Glenn's forehead became clearer. Burp. Glenn finally had the chance to throw up. It could be easily mastered, but it would come with a cost. The cultivator was likely to be deformed in some way. Glenn hassled with the strong points and weak points of cultivating the hematology sorcery. Glenn regained his vigor and pulled out his crystal ball from his coat to try to contact Lafitte and the others. The Mark 200 square kilometers area was too expansive for the crystal ball to cover. Its coverage was, in effect, a range of merely 10 kilometers, allowing for the average level of the student's mental strength. The contact failed. So it seemed that Glenn's team, or now Laffitt's team, had been dispersed remotely. 
Glenn checked the map and found no major landmarks that might lead his team members together. So he took a random road in the woods. As Glenn drew along, he was caught off guard by a colony of nameless wasps which were antagonized for a reason that Glenn had no idea of and were buzzing in on him. Glenn miscalculated the danger he was in. His enemies came from Mother Nature, too. There must be hundreds of them. I will be gone in minutes, Glenn thought as he produced the bubble shield again. The swarm of wasps patted on the shield heavily and intermittently like great raindrops crashing on the glass windows of the penthouses. Certainly, these little creatures didn't have sufficient offense power to crack the shield, nor did it require Glenn to consume his magical force to support it in the defense. They were coming at him stubbornly even when many of them had been sprung off. So Glenn was entrapped, and the Ashen Mask, the producer of the shield, was not able to replenish the element energy, which was extracted from nature, to keep itself working. But sorcerers fought tough wars using their wisdom instead of using violent means. Violence, if not properly leveraged, was tantamount to silliness. Glenn pulled out a vial of potion, and it gave out a scent of no decent nature as Glenn opened it. The odd scent dissipated through the shield and filled the air. The forceful wasps were dispelled and fled away as if there was a flood washing them. The wasps gone, Glenn was covering his mouth to protect himself from the foul odor. Suddenly, a few meters away from him, something in the bush moved. Glenn approached toward the bush for a few steps but stopped. Although the first day mirrors had not arrived and thus only a few students would have the upper hand without its help, there were gifted ones like Kyrie and Bayona, and his enemies might be from other sorcery schools of which he had little knowledge. And what if it was a wild hog or something whose impact was too strong for the shield to hold? As Glenn was thinking how he would deal with the thing in the bush, it moved again. Glenn took a couple of steps further toward it. The thing suddenly broke the entangled and unkempt branches and emerged. Ha, a man! Glenn sneered. The man appeared rather panicked. He must have seen how Glenn defeated the former two students and the wasps and thought Glenn was too powerful to have as an enemy. Before saying anything, he had scuttled. Glenn extended his right arm towards the man and a vine appeared. The vine crept quickly yet tenaciously along the ground and tripped the escaping man by tying his ankles. It was the magical tool Laffit sent him that had produced the vine. Humph, such a lame sorcery is gonna get me. The man puffed and his feet slowly turned into a pair of bovine hooves and easily got out of the vine ring. As the man stood up and got ready to run again, Glenn started the firebird and sent the fire to chase him. It seemed that this man was stronger than the former two, and he had mastered some quite good sorceries. Right before the fire was going to catch him, he melted into a ball of blood and spurted away. Glenn came to where the man had vanished, looking a little bit downcast, but he found some blood stains on the ground. Ha ha, you idiot. You left your personal information. Let's see if you've raised symbiotic insects or not. Glenn laughed insidiously. Glenn set up an altar and put a straw man on the center of it. He then dipped his finger on the blood stain and chanted. As Glenn was murmuring, a cloud of red mist floated upwards. The escaping man halted a few minutes later when he had made sure that Glenn was not following and was sure that he had surely exceeded the attack range of the firebird. Luck is so against me. The first day being in this damn place and I came across such a freak. The man complained. The next second, he broke out in cold sweat and suddenly he could not see anything. No, no. I am cursed. The man became desperate and scurried around in blindness. Glenn tracked him down half an hourglass later using his enhanced odor discerning capability and found him burnt out because of the curse. You poor silly soul. Why did you cultivate such a sorcery for running? And you haven't bred your symbiotic insects. That is suicide. Chapter 34 The Hunting Continued Translator, John underscore Editor, Zane underscore
There was someone worthy of mention now in the Bramble Forest, Baird from the Umbra School of Sorcerers. Baird was humble and had a profound wisdom, while the biggest feature that distinguished him was his fiery ambition to be great. He had held the belief that over time he would be able to beat all existing sorcerers on the sorcerer continent, and he had acted so. For three years, he devoted all of his time to sorcery learning, and he overtook everyone around him and was catapulted to fame as someone with the potential to be included in the top ten sorcerers in the school. He had been convinced that given more time, he would have overpowered them one by one. This was his pride. Now the first year's sorcery test was his opportunity to prove himself, and he could barely hold back his desire to laugh at the horrible countenance assumed by the students when the Umbra schools announced the commencement of the test. The test was a feast where he could entertain himself by relishing in the food. He bowed his head to try to conceal his evil craving to kill. Kill one student, take his chain on his forehead and I will get five hundred magical stones. That is way too easy. God knows I earn merely dozens of stones a month, Baird said to himself. That would be five thousand stones to take ten students and ten thousand for twenty an. Baird's eyes dilated in excitement. This test is just a collection of magical stones, and I am sure none of the contestants from the Umbra or any other sorcery schools could really take me on. All I care about is the Holy Tower trials, thought Baird. And in the bramble forest now, while he was waiting for the first arrival of the magical mirrors, he had killed four other matchtakers and obtained two thousand stones. With such an amount of money, I could buy all the stuff I need when I get back to school. Those ten best students would be crushed like bugs by me, if they had the luck to get out of the test. Baird seemed to have become too obsessed when he last took a student's life as he penetrated his paw into the student's body and pulled it out. Half an hour glass passed. During this time, Baird had not hunted one student, nor had he even encountered one because of the huge power he had absorbed from the chain marks of the dead ones, and the chain on his forehead was sending robust signals in waves as a result. Any students who had came in his vicinity had thought of him as an unbeatable enemy and had stayed clear of him. Suddenly, he paused as he sniffed a signal coming out from behind a shrubbery. He bemoaned, how long has it been since I last killed one? You poor little kitty. Baird made a few further steps towards the shrubbery. Both his hands shifted into a pair of paws with which he had ended the four student's life, and his entire body was, almost simultaneously, covered in scales. On the surface of the scales was a sticky mucus. They were shining in the sunlight, which came through the gaps between the tree leaves. The shift made, he moved in on the prey with an agility like that of a leopard. Little kitten. I am coming. Don't be afraid. Baird circumvented the shrubbery and was shocked at the sight before him. A large expanse of low-growing grass and tree branches had been scorched. The ground was pitted. It was as if there had been an explosion. A real explosion was not possible as there was no such things as powders, but sorceries could produce powers that were far more effective in producing such a mess. There must have been a big fight. At least twenty students must have been engaged. Baird estimated. The weird thing was that no dead body was found, and as he searched farther, he observed that a man was panting and was supporting himself with his hands pressing on his thighs. Baird gulped. A cold sweat dropped, but he didn't realize it. The signals being sent out from the unknown man's chain mark was so forceful. The chain mark was the sun and the signals were the solar wind being pushed forward in every direction. How many students had he killed to send so penetrating signals? Baird wondered. There is no way I can cope with him. Baird had forgotten his initial intention of being here and only wanted a way out of this nightmare. The man straightened and turned around to face Baird. Baird was almost blinded by the light reflected by a white mask into his eyes. It was Glenn. He had not met a real enemy in this forest and six students had died under his firebird. Each chain mark contained different levels of power, 
Unfortunately, Glenn had killed one student whose chain mark represented a power that amounted to four ordinary chain marks. So he had essentially accumulated ten chain marks. He had been bothered by the inconvenience of the intense signals too as the weaker students recognized the signals and immediately ran away. Glenn was like a source of fire, and the heat kept almost all students away. But it was indeed almost. Baird coming to Glenn was an accident, since he had lost his reason in hunting his prey. He wouldn't have done it if he had come to himself and evaluated what kind of power Glenn's signal represented. And there was a group of four students who had overestimated their power and intentionally took on Glenn, in the hope of winning the jackpot. They risked their lives and lost them. By the time Baird came to the site, Glenn had destroyed them and absorbed their chain marks. The explosion was the fight between them and Glenn. Again, luck was with Glenn for the weakest one among the group had a chain worth three average marks in terms of power, and the strongest had eight. So, Glenn had a chain mark that equaled to 33 basic marks. The signals spreading out from Glenn's chain mark were in rings and the radius of influence reached 100 meters. Glenn turned about and saw Baird. A man had only five basic chain marks. Glenn smirked. Still, it's 2,000 magical stones. Glenn watched Baird wickedly while consuming an intermediate magical stone to replenish his magical force. Before Glenn could react, Baird took a run. Glenn was quite confused since Baird had the courage to confront him, but he was now escaping without a fight fought. The confusion aside, Glenn produced a large winged bat that was twice his size. He then rode it to go after Baird. As the bat was fluttering its huge wings, Glenn rose and fell in the air, and his chain mark was giving off the strongest signals ever. Any recipient of these signals fled from it. There was an approach to keep the waving of the signals within the smallest scope possible. That was when one's magical force was at its maximum and the owner was not using it. Baird was now within the range of Glenn's firebird. Glenn seized the moment and called the firebird to pursue him. Baird yelled. He did not turn his head as he had busied himself in running fearing that any meaningless moves might delay him and render his as a tool for Glenn to gain magical stones. But he felt that an energized wave coming at him. In his desperation, Baird produced a magical tool which was said to be a priceless instrument. It was actually a shield, partly visible and it was flowing at its original place. The firebird hit the shield, and the explosive fire shuttled in every direction with a deafening sound. To the surprise of both of the fighters, the shield withstood the fire, but due to the impact, it nearly turned visible. Baird heaved a sigh of relief. How could it be possible? Glenn frowned. Glenn would have definitely crushed the shield if he had used more of his magical force for another round or two strikes, but he had consumed too much magical force in previous battles and if he were to be attacked by a mighty enemy, he might be in a very unfavorable condition. Before he could get the mirror, he'd better be more defensive, rather than being offensive. Today is your lucky day. I'll spare your life. Glenn sighed. Baird then made a quick escape. Glenn settled the bat and focused on recovering his magical force through the consumption of magical stones. Also, Glenn grabbed two magical tools with no mundane utility on the first day's wrestles. Baird had run out of Glenn's range of attack and was finally relieved. He complained, what a freak. I almost got killed on the first day of the test. Thank God I bought the void shield. Now maybe I should set aside the task of head counting and find my school fellows. Chapter 35, In Front of the House Where the Mirror is Hidden Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore. As mentioned in the last chapter, Glenn had consumed much of his magical force to create the firebird, so to keep himself from any possible dangers while replenishing his magical force, he buried himself three meters below the ground through the silex, a seed of a flower he had received from sorcerer Elaine. And Glenn found that if his magical force was at maximum value and when he made no physical movement, 
his chain mark would vanish temporarily and would no longer be felt by people around him. However, any movement of his body would activate his chain mark, and thus, the signals, when the value of his magical force was full, the scope where these signals could reach was much more limited. It was the first day of the test and the first batch of mirrors were going to arrive. Knowing that his magical force had been nearly refilled, Glenn tapped a leaf of the flower that he was in, and it moved upwards slowly until the soil overhead loosened and the flower broke out of the ground. When Glenn dripped a drop of potion on it, it immediately constricted back to a seed. Glenn headed toward a mountain. On his way, he did not bump into anybody because despite the fact that Glenn's magical force was full, whenever he moved, anyone within around 30 meters could feel the signals. The students invariably shunned him. The mountain was about three kilometers away from Glen, and the night screen was going to hang down in about an hourglass. Even from such a long distance, Glen could see that the mountain was coated in thick trees and bushes. Suddenly, there came a long howl. The mirrors have arrived. Glen felt a thrill going through him, and he ran full throttle towards the nearest mirror, which was in that mountain. So did the rest of the test takers. Glenn did run into a few number of students but they uniformly stayed clear of him, and he was not in the mood of chasing them at the cost consuming his magical force which might be put into better use in the scramble for the mirror. Everyone in the Bramble Forest had now reached that consensus, and thus, the weaker were in a relatively safe position before arriving at the spot. In a few moments, Glenn had reached the place where the mirror was hidden. A mirror in such a shabby house. Glenn felt dismayed, fearing that the mirror's power might be overpowered. At the time, about thirty students had arrived before the house. What interested Glenn's attention was a big tree, around thirty meters high. The long arms of the tree were waving in the wind as if they were guarding the house by entangling the invading enemies and strangling them. When Glenn had a closer look at it, he discovered that the tree was alive, and the long flapping arms were in effect arms. It had a large twitching mouth and looking through it, two lines of jagged teeth were shining in the nightfall. It was this tree that had made the roaring howl. This is the Colorado Nightmare Tree. What is special about it is that it has to be fed once in a hundred years with human blood, a student in the thirty or so group said. And we are so doomed to be here at the time of him in need of food. Another student echoed. That's true. I've seen three students swallowed by the monster, and he seems still hungry. A student exacerbated their frustration. Where can we get some food it needs? A stupid question made all the students present vigilant. The majority of the group had come single-handedly, but there were two who came together, and both of them had a ten-point chain mark, meaning they had killed some students and absorbed the power of their chain marks. The male one from the pair said something to the other, a female who was sitting on the back of a lion. The female didn't answer. She had not been prepared to annihilate the students and sent them to the avaricious mouth of that brute. Glenn watched and kept his body motionless, waiting to see how the situation would unfold. At that time, a student stepped forward towards the entrance of the house. He had employed invisibility sorcery but he could still be seen from time to time since that sorcery of his had obviously not been practiced to perfection. Therefore, the watchers were laughing coldly, waiting for the time when the rash boy would be engulfed. To their astonishment, that off-grade invisibility sorcery fooled the tree, and the boy succeeded entering the house. When the boy was sent away, a sound of metal colliding with metal broke out from inside the house, as if he had been sent off through a transmission gear. The students were all enraged. But the house did not disappear. So one mirror might serve more than once? Glenn and the two ten-point mark students speculated. The male student urged the female. If you haven't made your mind, I have. I have. The girl threw a sneering look at the boy. She then flapped the lion's rump and charged at the students, and the boy followed. The crowd's ability could, in no manner, match the pair. So, 
Some of them flustered into the house, a considerable number of them were caught by the tree and the others scampered off, no long caring for the Sha TTY mirror. In the distance, Glenn was still watching, assuming an extremely calm expression. Soon, a girl came to him in her desperation. Thank God, Glenn, help me. It's Olivia, from the Black Eye Sota. Please. The girl recognized that Glenn's chain mark belonged to her school, so she had run to him for help. Glenn stepped up and guided her to his back. Olivia was almost stressed out a moment ago and now she was temporarily in a safe haven, but her face was still bleached. The boy is cruel, and he is powerful. You be careful, Glenn, Olivia warned Glenn. Glenn had already sensed the signals sent by the boy's chain mark, and he was sure he would take the boy easily. But he just remained still to trap the boy coming closer to him. As the boy drew nearer, Glenn revealed a scary look as if he was the hunter, ready to have the prey. Glenn moved, although he had not wanted it. As Glenn made a move, his 33-point chain mark erupted and sent in waves of huge power that flooded Olivia behind him and the attacking boy who was only a few steps away. What the hell? The boy was almost petrified and in no time he rerouted to get clear of Glenn. But it was too late. The boy and the girl were both consumed by Glenn's firebird. I will come back for you, you masked man. A student who had escaped a hundred meters away screamed at Glenn. Glenn ignored the threat. Instead, he was counting the newly collected chain marks. Good, eighteen points of new chain marks. In the slaughter, Glenn had, in fact, killed another two students besides the pair. Olivia was the only one left unhurt. She was standing there, terrified by Glenn's brutality and the prospect of being killed by him. However, Glenn smiled to himself and was about to comfort her when the tree spoke. You have more than thirty points of chain marks. You are granted the access to the house. Interesting. Glenn looked up towards the tree. Chapter 36, Warning from a Purported Sorcerer Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore what had sent the boy away before Glenn entered the house was indeed a metal transmission gear. In front of the gear was a table, and nine identical canes were standing on it. Each of the canes was latched in a tube, and one had been taken because it had been emptied. The boy before me must have taken it. But is the mirror reward merely a stick? Glenn thought. Still wondering whether that ordinary looking thing might be useful, Glenn touched it. The moment he put his hand on it, his body immediately twisted and he then disappeared, producing a swoosh sound. Unlike last time when he was delivered to the bramble forest from the large scale at school, Glenn didn't feel sick. As he estimated, it was a only transmission around several kilometers away. The cane was transferred along with Glenn. He then held it in his hands and studied it. This is rubbish. A stick with forty points of offense power? I can buy one at the marketplace of the Black Tower, Glenn complained. But as he examined it further, he detected a rarity about it, it could benumb the one being attacked by it, and it worked really fast. At the time, Glenn felt the existence of another mirror, and it was not far. It occurred to Glenn that his little group might be there for the mirror, and hopefully, laugh it might be there too. So, he started to take a run toward the new mirror house, reckless of the strong signals released from his chain mark that would undoubtedly scare off his praise. In a few minutes, Glenn got to the house. Dozens of students had been present there. Almost all of them stepped backwards when they saw him, and they were all looking him in awe, pondering why a student could master such a high-level chain mark. Among them, a student looked furious and he provoked, Glenn. Why are you here? Where is Laffit? It was Armida, one of the twelve superiors and a pursuer of Laffit. He was wearing a bushy beard and glared at Glenn with hostility. Armida. Glenn responded politely, seemingly not bothered by Armida's rudeness. 
As Glenn approached Armida, the heart of Vine Ring hung down from his ear glowed. Ironically, the ring shined and Armida's heart paled. He recognized the ring. It belonged to Laffit. Why is it you? Why did Laffit choose you? Armida could no longer keep his anger in. Before Glenn tried to offer an explanation, Armida snarled. At the same time, long and thick black hair grew from his chest, back and limbs and finally his face. And his body swelled 1.5 times of his original size. He had turned. Hematology sorcery. Chimpanzee transformation. Glenn knew the power of that sorcery, and he collected his magical force within his body, ready to fight. But he was not interested in getting involved in a fight since Armida had two students as his company on this site, and the students present were likely to conspire to destroy a strong enemy like him. A woo. Armida grunted. He was on the verge of launching an attack. Armida, don't. One of the students accompanying him warned. He is too strong. Those nice words seem to have backfired. Armida leapt towards Glenn. However, Glenn was determined to quell this battle. As stated earlier, he didn't have the intention to antagonize such a large crowd. Besides, if he engaged and killed him, he wasn't sure how Laffit would react to it. Therefore, after Glenn threw himself onto the ground to dodge Armida's pounce, he placated Armida. Armida. It's enough. Stop this foolishness, Glenn berated. You wanna know why Laffit choose me instead of you? It's because I saved her life. She was in danger when we were on the ship to the Black Isotter, and I saved her. That's all. You are better than me. It's just you met her later than me. Glenn could see that there were tears in Armida's dilated eyes. For all three years, Armida had been doing everything he could to woo her, while she even refused to give him an opportunity. The pain resulting from it was excruciating. It was understandable that he hated Glenn. As the saying goes, the deeper the love is, the more badly one could get hurt. Armida seemed to have lost his heart. His brutality was gone. The deck was stacked against him, at least in term of Laffit. Consequently, his body shrunk and the unnecessary hair disappeared. He then turned back to his two fellow students. The interlude had ended. Glenn strode to the tree, which was the reason why none of the crowd had been able to or had the courage to enter the house where the mirror lied. It was also a Colorado nightmare tree only smaller than the one which guarded the mirror Glenn had acquired last time. Hello, Big Tree. I'd like to ask for permission to enter the house. Glenn asked graciously. The rest of the students were taken aback while most of them were hoping that the tree would entangle him and choke him to death. Of course. You have a more than thirty points of chain mark and thus, the right to enter the house, the tree replied. There is one thing, though. You have already acquired one mirror. The attainment of another one has the possibility of going against you, the tree added. Permission granted, Glenn approached the house. However, something strange happened. Glenn felt a weird wave of energy coming from within the house, and it was very different from those given by from the students. The energy was actually suppressing his own energy and made it unable to function properly. What was more creepy was that the waves of energy seemed to only target Glenn himself. Glenn had a hunch that if he had applied his magical force now, a considerable part of it would have been neutralized. Was this energy related to real sorcerers? Glenn wondered. As Glenn held out his hand and was hesitating if he should let go of this opportunity, he trembled. A gush of strong wave pushed out against him. Glenn realized that it might be a warning, and he would be punished, perhaps seriously, if he opened the door. Glenn paused there for around ten seconds. He finally made his mind and left. What is this weird energy? Was it coming from a sorcerer? Does the power from the student's chain marks originate from it? 
A volley of questions bothered Glenn. Seeing such a formidable enemy leave, the students were relieved. A few students were curious to have a talk with the tree, but ended up as food for it. The reason was simple, they didn't have the 30 points of chain mark. Chapter 37, Being Despised Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore Having left the mirror house, Glenn sought a hidden place and recovered his magical force to the maximum. Then he checked his crystal ball to see if his teammates had contacted him, which showed that no information had been received. Glenn headed randomly in the forest since he had been warned by a mysterious force not to touch a second mirror, and his teammates were nowhere to be found. Glenn's strong signals emanating from his chain mark had kept all the other students along his way off, although he had tried his best to contain them. After a few hourglasses of wandering in the forest, he bumped into a leopard. The leopard seemed very hungry as if it had not eaten any food for days. Being strong and agile, it still didn't have the courage to hunt the prey in front of it. As the Chinese saying have it, a cooked duck flies away, meaning that the leopard had to let go of a ready meal even while it was starving. Animals could sense Glenn's signals, too. When Glenn arrived at a clearing, he sat on the ground for a rest. As Glenn was meditating to relax himself as well as to improve his mental strength, he could detect a strong wave of signals not far from him. Actually, whoever had sent out these signals had been stalking even before Glenn met the leopard. Glenn had turned around from time to time to check what was going on in a way as naturally as possible, but he had found nothing. Invisibility Sorcery Glenn could not help but murmur. That's why I couldn't see him. The student following Glenn was indeed invisible because of the invisibility sorcery, and had been taking extra caution by staying 50 meters away from Glenn. That was a distance from which Glenn couldn't locate him, huh? Overhearing Glenn's murmuring, the follower immediately ran away. Who was that? Which school does the guy come from? Doubts invaded Glenn's mind. An hourglass later, Glenn's crystal ball received a message. It was Nina. Glenn was excited, and he sped up towards Nina. He had been rambling in this woods for almost a day and had finally contacted one of his friends. Soon, Glenn came before an expansive mushroom land. Mushrooms abounded in this forest, and there was nothing worthy of mention about it. Glenn took notice of these fungi, but he could not care less when he cut across the land. When he accidentally stamped on a mushroom, its cap, pileus, exploded and the spores on the underside of the cap were spurted out and then pervaded the air. Glenn's head became completely dizzy, and everything around him faded and became twisted as though they were unreal. Shaasterisk T. I have been attacked by a fantasy sorcery. It was triggered by scent. Glenn was panicked and the effect was amplified by my enhanced sense of smell. The fantasy sorcery was not initiated by any students. The mushrooms did it. It was a trap devised by nature. Glenn's necklace was supposed to defend fantasy strikes like this, but this time, it failed to be effective possibly because this psychedelic worked out a magic through Glenn's advanced olfactory system. As Glenn became dizzier, he recalled how his symbiotic insects, the gadflies, could fight against curses and other fantasy sorceries. He then stimulated the gadflies in his body, and the insects moved and hummed, producing unbearable noises in his ears. The penetrating buzz brought Glenn to sobriety in a few seconds. That was close. Glenn felt relieved. He had endured the dizziness for only less than a minute, but in that minute, Glenn was extremely vulnerable to attacks, since he was stripped of his defense power completely. Luckily, when he was struggling, his chain mark released large amount of power which, in a sense, deterred potential invaders. Glenn stepped backwards and carefully navigated away from the mushroom land. Glenn was fortunate when the gadflies saved his life by helping him regaining his consciousness. When the insects were acting in his belly to fight against his vertigo, 
Glenn felt that part or parts of his body were responding to the gadflies. And the reaction affected Glenn in some strange way, yet, he could not articulate how. Did the reaction relate to the special abilities of the gadflies as mentioned in the books? Glenn asked himself. Does it have something to do with the life code? Glenn packed a piece of the exploded mushroom, thinking that it may be used in later experiments for the life code. Glenn was hungry now, and he took out two bars of compressed meat to satiate his hunger. When he was half full, his expression suddenly became intense. A chain mark that has over 30 points of power. Who could it be? At the time, Glenn and the mysterious man who both had over 30 points of power were sending out vigorous waves of signals that formed an unusual space. Who are you? Your chain mark has over 30 points of power, the first one I met here with such ability, Glenn asked. The other student looked horrifyingly pale. He ran his eyes through Glenn but did not reply. Instead, he played with a mouse that was standing on his shoulder. A mouse? The arrogance. Could it be Kyrie? Glenn thought. Glenn saw Kyrie back on the ship twice. The first time was when Kyrie and Bayona coming to the deck to watch the pirates who escaped. The other occasion was when Kyrie fought with Sorcerer Dior against the giant octopus. Ever since the students set their feet on the Black Isotter, Kyrie and Bayona, the two geniuses, had been taken away by the wrinkle-faced witch, and Glenn had never seen them, and vice versa. And the student looked extremely pale. That was why he could not recognize Kyrie in the first place. Kyrie? Glenn attempted a question. Are you from the Black Isotter? Kyrie reacted to the question. Ye. Glenn was interrupted. Kyrie didn't care where he was from or it could be said that he was afraid of meeting a schoolfellow because he had been told by his mentor to not to kill anyone who belonged to the Black Isotter. It would not be a sin if he was not aware of the sin when he committed it. You have a strong chain mark. Hope you could be a rival. Kyrie's pale face turned vicious. When Glenn heard the word rival, his body shook. He had witnessed what Kyrie was capable of. Back on the ship. In the school, he had been taken care of by the designated best sorcerers as a talented student. God knew how many powerful sorceries he commanded. A creaking sound broke. It turned out that Kyrie had forced an attack on Glenn. Glenn responded quickly by generating his shield. The shield sagged greatly as if it was hit by something blunt. The offense came quickly and went quickly, too. After the attack was retracted, the shield reverted to its original state. To block the offense, Glenn had consumed a large share of his magical force. How powerful was that attack? It must have contained 80 to 90 points of offense power. Glenn sweated. 80 to 90 points of offense power was a value that Glenn could not achieve. Ha ha, the shield worked good. Try this one. Kyrie smiled. Glenn did not have the time to take a preemptive strike and the second assault came. Undoubtedly, Glenn produced the shield again. This time, Glenn was attacked as if by a ramming rhinoceros. When the invisible force slammed the shield, Glenn's magical force was immediately depleted. As a result, he was pushed seven or eight steps backwards before he could steady himself. The offense power exceeded 100 points. Even with the help of my magical ring, I can't take any more such attacks. Glenn was now in a dire situation. His life was in severe danger. That magical tool of use is powerful. Receiving such a tool from your mentor will get you and your mentor punished, don't you know that? You violated the Seven Rings rules, Kyrie sneered. Seizing the moment, Glenn produced the firebird by consuming the magical force offered by his magical ring to take the initiative. Kyrie pointed to the firebird, and the bird then spun fast and was gone. Seconds later, it exploded about 200 meters away. 
no wonder he was reputed the most talented student in the last 100 years. The Lilith school of sorcerers was right. He is way powerful than me. Glenn sighed. Now, let's try the physical attack. Kyrie pulled out a dagger and threw it towards Glenn. Glenn knew that the shield would not block the dagger since it had such low level of magical force. So he created the vine to track and hopefully entangle the dagger. Surprisingly, the vine ensnared the dagger and pulled it to the ground. Ha ha, interesting. The same smile appeared on Kyrie's face. You are good. You have a powerful magical tool. More important than that, you are able to use it. Magical tools are levers, and you made good use of them. That is what is great about you. Kyrie continued while Glenn was standing there, pretending to be fine. Still, you and your mentor have breached the Seven Rings rules for the trial. I will tell my mentor about it, and you will be punished. Kyrie finished the appraisal and the threat and then left. Chapter 38 Nina was mired. Translator John underscore Qui editor, Zane underscore. Nina. Nina. Glenn shouted continuously into his crystal ball, trying to contact Nina to determine her location. After a sizzling sound, Nina communicated her message to Glenn. Glenn, are you doing okay? Yeah, I am fine. What about your situation? Are you in any trouble? Did you contact other people in our team? Glenn was not delighted. From the images received from his crystal ball, Nina was running in a panic and was ready to cry out. Glenn, several people are chasing me, people from the Compass School of Sorcerers. I just heard from Laffit and Robin. They are coming for me. And Lowry is with me. Lowry was really into Nina despite her permanently injured eye. However, he had neither good appearance nor prowess in terms of sorcery. Besides, he came across as awkward in movement. So Nina had refused to accept his love. Why are they doing that? Glenn sounded rather anxious. It was Lowry. He discovered a moon chirper. When we were digging, it chirped and attracted them. Oh. In the crystal ball. Glenn saw that Nina dropped to the ground. Then the ball became dark and the contact was lost. She is in real trouble. The students from the Compass School won't let her go with the moon chirper, a plant that is alive. Glenn felt more worried. The moon chirper was much sought after because it could double the efficiency of meditation, which could result in improvement of the practitioner's mental strength. One prerequisite was that the chirper had to be in the moonlight to work. A considerable number of sorcerers were interested in getting one. Glenn cared for Nina. So, the moment he realized the danger she was in, he sprinted toward Nina. As for Nina, the place where she tripped turned from hard ground to a swamp, and she was stuck. Nina! Lowry cried out. Lowry's capabilities were mostly related to pharmaceutics and thus, they couldn't be put into use in rescuing Nina. Born into a Fisher family, he had rough and dark skin, and he was slow with his words. The compass schoolers were closing in. Since Nina was bogged, Lowry would undergo the same fate as her if he chose to stay. And he stayed for the love of his life. Stop, or I will destroy the chirper. I will definitely do it. Lowry threatened the pursuers while holding the chirper firmly in his hand. The way Lowry protected Nina was desperate. If Chris, Nina's brother, had been here, there wouldn't have been a problem. The siblings had worked on a sorcery that would be brought to maximum power when one of the pair played an auxiliary role, and they had succeeded. Unfortunately, Chris was not here. Lowry was the only one Nina's life depending on. Lowry tightened his grip of the chirper. The force made it scream like a baby, and its fluffy roots swung as it wiggled its body. Is this a threat? Ha ha, we are not to be threatened. You do anything to the chirper, and you will be dead. 
The head pursuer returned in the same menacing voice. But he was frightened by the prospect of the chirpa being ruined. Nina was struggling in the mire, and she had been immersed from below her waist. Nina had her mask on. So, even though she was feeling pathetic, not knowing if she was going to die this way, nobody could catch her expressions. Hello, Belle. I couldn't think of you dying so miserably. As long as you ask that stupid brat to give us the thing, you will be fine. A member from the chasing team approached Nina, and stopped at the edge of the mire. No. Don't you ever touch her, Lowry's threat turned into entreaty. The hunting team had deemed Lowry as a coward who could not do something serious. Nina's mask was thrown off. Pukey. What an ugly freak. The boy who produced a sorcery that peeled off Nina's mask wretched. He then turned to Lowry, with a livid expression on his face. You give me that thing in three seconds or I will destroy you. Nina was now exposed. She was completely terrified. If one could see through the mire, they would see her legs trembling. On hearing the threat, Lowry had lost his courage and threw the moon chirper into the air. The head of the pursuing team became suddenly alert and was ready to catch the chirper. What the f asterisk ck? What is that? The chief cursed. When the chirper was thrown to the apex, a student who was not known to any of the students present at the scene was seen in the tree, just a few meters away behind the chirper. He then squirted his tongue. The tongue extended unbelievably and rolled up the chirper. The student had hidden himself in the tree since the bullying scene began, and nobody had sensed anything about his being here. If Glenn had been on the spot, he would have sensed his existence through his enhanced olfactory function. Interestingly enough, this boy was the one who had stalked Glenn and escaped when Glenn realized that he was being followed. Chapter 38 Nina was mired. Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore. Nina. Nina. Glenn shouted continuously into his crystal ball, trying to contact Nina to determine her location. After a sizzling sound, Nina communicated her message to Glenn. Glenn, are you doing okay? Yeah, I am fine. What about your situation? Are you in any trouble? Did you contact other people in our team? Glenn was not delighted. From the images received from his crystal ball, Nina was running in a panic and was ready to cry out. Glenn, several people are chasing me, people from the Compass School of Sorcerers. I just heard from Laffit and Robin. They are coming for me. And Lowry is with me. Lowry was really into Nina despite her permanently injured eye. However, he had neither good appearance nor prowess in terms of sorcery. Besides, he came across as awkward in movement. So Nina had refused to accept his love. Why are they doing that? Glenn sounded rather anxious. It was Lowry. He discovered a moon chirper. When we were digging, it chirped and attracted them. Oh. In the crystal ball, Glenn saw that Nina dropped to the ground. Then the ball became dark and the contact was lost. She is in real trouble. The students from the Compass School won't let her go with the moon chirper, a plant that is alive. Glenn felt more worried. The moon chirper was much sought after because it could double the efficiency of meditation, which could result in improvement of the practitioner's mental strength. One prerequisite was that the chirper had to be in the moonlight to work. A considerable number of sorcerers were interested in getting one. Glenn cared for Nina. So, the moment he realized the danger she was in, he sprinted toward Nina. As for Nina, the place where she tripped turned from hard ground to a swamp, and she was stuck. Nina! Lowry cried out. Lowry's capabilities were mostly related to pharmaceutics and thus, they couldn't be put into use in rescuing Nina. Born into a Fisher family, he had rough and dark skin, and he was slow with his words. The compass schoolers were closing in. 
Since Nina was bogged, Lowry would undergo the same fate as her if he chose to stay. And he stayed for the love of his life. Stop, or I will destroy the chirper. I will definitely do it. Lowry threatened the pursuers while holding the chirper firmly in his hand. The way Lowry protected Nina was desperate. If Chris, Nina's brother, had been here, there wouldn't have been a problem. The siblings had worked on a sorcery that would be brought to maximum power when one of the pair played an auxiliary role, and they had succeeded. Unfortunately, Chris was not here. Lowry was the only one Nina's life depending on. Lowry tightened his grip of the chirper. The force made it scream like a baby, and its fluffy roots swung as it wiggled its body. Is this a threat? Ha ha, we are not to be threatened. You do anything to the chirper, and you will be dead. The head pursuer returned in the same menacing voice. But he was frightened by the prospect of the chirper being ruined. Nina was struggling in the mire, and she had been immersed from below her waist. Nina had her mask on. So, even though she was feeling pathetic, not knowing if she was going to die this way, nobody could catch her expressions. Hello, Belle. I couldn't think of you dying so miserably. As long as you ask that stupid brat to give us the thing, you will be fine. A member from the chasing team approached Nina, and stopped at the edge of the mire. No. Don't you ever touch her, Lowry's threat turned into entreaty. The hunting team had deemed Lowry as a coward who could not do something serious. Nina's mask was thrown off. Pukey. What an ugly freak. The boy who produced a sorcery that peeled off Nina's mask wretched. He then turned to Lowry, with a livid expression on his face. You give me that thing in three seconds or I will destroy you. Nina was now exposed. She was completely terrified. If one could see through the mire, they would see her legs trembling. On hearing the threat, Lowry had lost his courage and threw the moon chirper into the air. The head of the pursuing team became suddenly alert and was ready to catch the chirper. What the f asterisk ck? What is that? The chief cursed. When the chirper was thrown to the apex, a student who was not known to any of the students present at the scene was seen in the tree, just a few meters away behind the chirper. He then squirted his tongue. The tongue extended unbelievably and rolled up the chirper. The student had hidden himself in the tree since the bullying scene began, and nobody had sensed anything about his being here. If Glenn had been on the spot, he would have sensed his existence through his enhanced olfactory function. Interestingly enough, this boy was the one who had stalked Glenn and escaped when Glenn realized that he was being followed. Chapter 39 The Love Dialogue Translator, John underscore Qui Editor, Zane underscore. The moon chirper had disappeared with the man who hid himself in the tree. And on hearing Nina's message for assistance, Laffet and Glenn had been on their way there. Laffet arrived before Glenn, and with her was Alistair, whom Laffet ran into on her way here. Hardly had Laffet and Alistair arrived, when the gang of students from the Compass School fled. Laffet and Alistair's chain marks were sending powerful energy that scared the gutless students away. And Glenn was running towards Nina while pulling all stops. So, his high-level energy was felt even miles away. Laffet saved Nina from the swamp and asked her and Lowry to run. She then stationed with Alistair to face a tough adversary. The man finally came into sight. No. It was Glenn's mask. Laffet trembled. She recognized the ashen mask that person was wearing. It belonged to Glenn. The first thing that came into Laffet's mind was Glenn's death. Laffet speculated that the mask wearer must have killed Glenn and had taken it as his own property. At the moment, Laffet's unspeakable fury and hatred blew up. She was determined to take revenge. With a painful scream of resentment, Laffet took out an arrow, drew it and released it, which whizzed all the way to the stranger. Startled at this surprising attack, Glenn yelped. 
His worried voice reached Laffitt's ears. No. Is it Glenn? How could it be possible? Laffitt seemed to have lost her support and kneeled on the ground. She covered her face with her hands, looking aghast. She knew this arrow sorcery well. It was too powerful to be fended off or to be neutralized by an ordinary student. No one had been known to come out well from the sorcery. The arrow seemed to be so enraged that it moved as if it was a beam of light. Due to its high speed, the arrow produced a giant swirl and forced its way towards Glenn. Laffitt stared at the progressing whirl in astonishment. Nobody could be more clear about the effect of this sorcery than her. It was one of the most lethal sorceries in the world, and there was no way available to stop it. She was aware how the victim would die. The arrow would break into numerous leaves with sharp blades that would readily slice the enemy's throat. What have I done? I, I, ah, uh, Laffitt's face blanched. She was overwhelmed with tears. Alistair who had been watching all this felt shocked. For one thing, he was frightened on seeing the sorcery she'd just used. The arrow moving at an incredibly high speed aside, it was radiating signals whose effect was as destructive as 100 point degree energy, and it endured quite a long time. The sharp-tongued queen had been behaving in an overbearing way for a reason. More than that, Alistair had never seen Laffitt being so grieved. Laffitt could be sentimental. Laffitt, it's me. Glenn said faintly as he approached Laffitt. Glenn. Are you okay? Laffitt ran towards Glenn. The swirl of leaves with sharp blades had faded away. Glenn's shield had worked its magic again. However, the world took a great deal of Glenn's magical force. The amount of it was even not less than what was consumed in the previous war with Kyrie. It's me, Laffitt. I am fine. Glenn embraced Laffitt softly and kissed her forehead. And the next moment, he held her with his firm arms. Alistair had met Glenn once in the Black Isota. He was wearing that mask at the ball thrown by the Death Sail League. But now, when he watched Glenn, he doubted his memory because Glenn was waving out signals that were much stronger than Laffitt's. It was unbelievable. Glenn? Alistair asked tentatively. Hum, replied Glenn who loosened Laffitt and turned to Alistair. Alistair was a co-founder of the Death Sail League. He had Glenn's respect. It seemed to Alistair that Glenn was still that unsocialized guy, just as he remembered him. Although Glenn was pale, his faint look couldn't be noticed by Alistair. What Alistair saw was a calm and fathomless man. Who could survive an attack with such power? Alistair marveled. No wonder Laffitt refused Armida's love several times, even though he was a good man. It was just that Glenn is better. Alistair was feeling complex emotions. He had been enjoying the respect paid by the League's members, and sometimes, even complacency took over. He felt ashamed of his previous arrogance now. But he managed to smile at Glenn with grace. He then left to give them some privacy. What had worried Glenn had happened at last. There was this deep pride in Laffitt's heart. She was kind-hearted, to be sure. But she was a proud girl. She had always been so. Her father, the governor of Baisir City, gave her the privilege of being proud. Have you been treating me like an idiot? Like some clown who performs for you? Laffitt looked serious and questioned. Why? What is going on? Glenn returned a question. You have such strong energy signals, and you can even defend yourself from the whirl of leaves. How could you keep your capabilities from me for such a long time? Don't you know I was worried about you for this gory test? How could you be such a callous man? Laffitt stepped back, and the look on her face said that Glenn was a stranger to her. No, I didn't intend to do that. I was looking for the right moment. That's all. I had no intention of keeping this from you. Glenn stepped forward. 
You are the love my life. I am going to marry you someday. Love of your life. Marry? Ha! Huh? To marry someone who had been treated as a dog. To marry someone who puffed up herself with self-importance. That sounds to me an irony. Laugh it look up to Glenn. No, you are important. You are the vine sorcerer. You have always been the one protecting me from danger, on the ship and in Black Isota. I couldn't have lived without you. It was not that Glenn realized that only the mention of Lafitte's strength would have the better chance of calming her down. He meant it. He had thought of Lafitte as his protector, physically and mentally. It had to be admitted that Lafitte grinned when she heard Vine Sorcerer. The word Vine was reminiscent of the days when she was with Glenn back on the ship that delivered them to the Sorcerer School. Better, it reminded her when she hung in the air off the ship's hull and Glenn risked his life to come to her. It was Glenn who got down to the lifeboat and pulled her back. Lafitte had never thought she would love a person to such a degree a mundane and even lowly peasant. But, when she was nestling in his arms the moment she was saved, she had thought that she was willing to dedicate all she had to him. Lafitte's sneer dissolved. Glenn's love dissolved it. She watched Glenn in silence. But her hands were still quivering. Glenn noticed Lafitte's situation, and he took out a stick and put it in Lafitte's hand. Guess what this is? It is the booty I got from the mirror house. I need you to remember. No matter what happens, I will always be with you, to support you and to love you. But you will always be my protector. Glenn looked into Lafitte's eyes. Chapter 40, Glenn's Team Reunited Translator, John underscore Quee Editor, Zane underscore Three days later, Glenn's team Lafitte, Chris, Nina, Robinson and Robin reunited. Alistair parted ways with Lafitte when Glenn appeared. Alistair and Lafitte were both great sorcery students. And they had a history in killing the knights for the kids on the ship. They could have made a good team. But Glenn's emergence as the vanguard for the team had shifted the landscape. Alistair was a driven man, and he thought that parting from the team was in his best interests. Lowry left too, but for a different reason. He felt frustrated and humiliated about not being able to save Nina from the swamp. And Nina was insulted in front of him. He could not live with that fact. Lowry was not a warrior. But he stepped up at least, so he had Nina and the whole team's respect. Lafitte sat down on the body of a fallen tree in this Bremble forest. She cleared out a plot of ground, which was covered with layers of leaves, then she laid the map on the ground. We are here. Lafitte put a pin in somewhere on the map. Based on our guess, the second shipment of mirrors is going to land in here. It's not far from us. So we're in a good position. And this valley is hidden in the depth of the woods. We are less likely to be disturbed. So we're safe for now? Nina inquired. Yeah, unless someone speeds around and reveals his energy. Lafitte squinted towards Glenn and snorted. Glenn, you are amazing. I've heard about how you shielded yourself from Lafitte's arrow. How did you do that? Robinson had learned part of the story. He was informed about Glenn's astonishing survival story but not of his big fight with Lafitte. Lafitte cut in before Glenn could answer Robinson's question, although Glenn had no intention to answer at all. He is amazing. He is without a doubt the best among us. But Robinson, at least you and I have fought together and we know how we can strategize against a common foe. Him? A hermit, a loner at best. Robinson choked. Lafit is right. We can't afford to work alone. We need to figure out how to cooperate. We need synergy, said Chris who was holding an axe over his shoulder. Yeah, we need synergy. Lafit had recovered her composure and emphasized synergy. 
Chris sorceries were related to hematology sorcery and fell under the umbrella of violent offense. He could turn into a wolf while confronting an enemy. He would become faster and stronger. Glenn estimated his offense power ranging between 15 and 50 points, and for a second or so, it might exceed 70. That was awesome. But Chris's current magical force could merely sustain three or four exercises of the sorcery. Power came at the cost of depletion of magical force. So if Chris could not take his rival down in three or four rounds, he would be in real danger. That was when Nina and her sorcery came in handy. As mentioned before, Nina's sorceries were mostly auxiliary. Specifically, she could transfer her magical force to the one who was in need of it. More wonderfully, she had mastered a sorcery that could replenish her magical force quickly. Besides, a sorcerer student's magical force was roughly determined by his, her mental strength. To be precise, one's magical force would fluctuate up and down around ten times of his, her mental strength. For example, Glenn was tested by the crystal ball as having a mental strength of 13 points and a magical force of 125 points. In rare cases would one's magical force surpass that 1-10 ratio. Nina was that rare case. She had a magical force that was much higher than 10 times of her mental strength. She and Chris together could overpower a beast. With Glenn's great power, we fear nobody. Chris boasted. We are not that strong. Nina and I are not good at close-range fights. Laugh it warned. As for Robinson, his sorceries were designed for guerrilla warfare. He was said to have studied dark elements, which made him more mobile and flexible in surveillance and in sneak attacks. And he was excellent in not getting caught. Robinson's girlfriend Robin had had a sorcery which Glenn disapproved of. It was associated with the agreement invoke. Living things on the foreign land were regarded as slaves for sorcerers. A level for sorcerer could own a regiment composed of slaves from the foreign land. Students were not qualified to obtain one for their use. However, they could invoke them through agreement invoke. Robin had gotten two by doing so. One was a boar. It was 1.5 meters high and 4 meters long. As can be imagined, it was used to protect her from attacks. The other one was a green-eyed monkey. It would lie on her shoulder and acted as a third eye. The group had already witnessed Laffitt's potent arrow. One thing that had not been mentioned was the arrow's range. It could easily reach beyond 50 meters. That was not an unusual distance. What distinguished it was that it still carried a 30-40 point of energy even 50 meters after its launch. Glenn's firebird sorcery would decimate everything that came in the way, but it worked only within 15 meters. So it could be imagined what a threat that arrow meant. More horribly, she had four hurricane arrows placed in the sheath on her back. If the arrow that hit Glenn had been one of them, Glenn would not have lived to see Laffit. Besides, Laffit had also learned something about medical treatment. So they decided that Chris, Nina, and Glenn were responsible for the frontal offense. Laffit would flank. And Robinson was charged with detecting signs of potential invaders, and in certain circumstances, he would assume the task of distracting the enemy. Night fell. A black shadow sneaked into Glenn's tent. Glenn's sensitive nose had sensed the visitor, but he didn't move because it was Laffit. They started making out soon. For days later, fourteen students from the Light and Shade School of Sorcerers bumped into Glenn's team. It seemed that the school fellas had teamed up for a better survival rate. The black Isotter. The girl who was leading the team provoked. She was wearing a dress that had a slit a little below her waist in the front. A whip was wiggling in her hand. It was said to be a cane created using a magical tool. Some said it was a creature invoked from the foreign land. Hum, kids from light and shade. Son of sun. 1. Defeated Golden Eye, 2. So what? Do you think you stand a chance of taking us? 
Laffit was not afraid at all. She knew nothing about fear, and had Glen. Yesterday, Goldeneye had lost out to Son of Sun and was chased almost through the whole testing ground. The fight was seen by many. That girl watched and licked her lips with her tongue. She still hadn't decided whether to give the order for attack. What are they waiting for? To fight or to surrender? What are they nagging about? Chris was vexed. Ha! Huh. We'd better listen to laugh it. We're aiming for the second batch of mirrors. The magical tools are deemed to cause real trouble to even the desperators. 3. We will try to gain the initiative, said Robin as she tried to calm Chris down. Footnotes. 1, 2, 3, Son of Sun and Goldeneye are among the desperators, the ones who are so powerful that they make their opponents desperate. In the brochure sent out to the students by each school before the test, it records seven desperators from six sorcery schools. They were deemed as potential sorcerers and had been received as students by senior students or even sorcerers. Son of Sun is from the Light and Shade and Goldeneye is from the Black Isotter.